wabarakatuh. Minglaba, namaste, and marhaba to all our audience and viewers. And before we start, uh, I would like to uh, thanks to SBS Rohingya Australia for promoting our Rohingya Remembrance Series. Um, you know, that is, um, you know, very honorable and grateful um, to you that, you know, you guys promoted my Rohingya Remembrance Series. And also to my all Rohingya by boy, you know, all over the world. Um, thank you so much for, you know, a lot of love and support for our, you know, for Empower Success Media YouTube web series. And before uh, we introduce our uh, speaker, um, first of all, uh, you know, uh, soon, inshallah, uh, our team is trying our best to launch Rohingya, sorry, to launch uh, Empower Success Media series in Amazon Prime Video. Our mission is to spread, uh, you know, all these uh, genocide issues, human rights issues, and, you know, to all over the world so that, you know, uh, our mission is to make, uh, you know, our human society into ethical and, you know, um, strong uh, humanitarian world. That is our main mission. So, yeah, uh, let me introduce you our first speaker. So our first speaker, he is very young and very um, innovative, creative and very poetic person. And his name is No Sadik. He loves poems a lot. And sometimes, you know, his poems make me cry sometimes because they are very meaningful and very, uh, you know, thoughtful as well. And also he is very ambitious, very determined. And um, it was so, so hard for me to reach out to Nul Sadiq. Uh, because he's living in the Kok Bazaar refugee camp. Um, you know, in the camp, there's no internet. And uh, also, uh, you know, most of the refugee, um, they are having financial problems as well. And so he doesn't have enough data to do Zoom meeting with me. And uh, I was, when I heard it, I was so, um, you know, sad. So somehow, you know, uh, he is able to send me his uh, videos that I have asked him the question. So therefore, um, you know, I will, so you guys will see like his uh, video coming in second part. So the first question I have asked him is, please tell us your life journey in Myanmar before genocide. And second question I have asked him is, please tell us your family's uh, jobs and business while you and your family are living in Myanmar before genocide. Hi, Assalamu Alaikum. My name is Noor Sadek. I was born in Nenshom village, Naten, Mondo, the Rekai estate of Myanmar. I'm 18 years old and I'm a young Rohingya poet living in the world's largest refugee camp. And this is my story. I was born in 5 June 2002 in Myanmar. Since then to 24, I couldn't sleep once on my father's shoulder because my father was in list of wanted people. In 1998, my father went to Saudi Arabia to earn money to support to his family, my grandparents and my elder brothers. He couldn't stay there for a long period because he had no citizenship of Saudi Arabia. So he had to back to own country, Myanmar, through river. Since then, Myanmar army called Nasaka was looking for daddy to arrest him in order to give him punishment for interning in online. There were two cases given by Myanmar army on my daddy. One is using mobile phone and another one is entering back to online through river. 
In our country, there were no permission for Rohingya to use mobile phone, but daddy used it for personal um, issue, like daddy, had, daddy has our relatives in abroad, so daddy had to talk with them. At that time, my daddy could not spend time with us because mostly he had to spend time in the hill in order to get protection from hands of Myanmar army. Where he couldn't even get foods properly. Sometimes I alone with my family cried for so many times to see daddy but I could not because his time was really bad. He could come at home twice in a week. If he could come at home, he could only spend two hours to three hours with us and go back to the hill. He had to face like this situation for nine years. Within nine years, the other two younger brothers were born. Then we were totally five brothers and I was the third one. We three of our brothers could not be on family list because um, daddy was illegal made by me on my army and he couldn't be in the department who work on with family list but we were on blacklist blacklist mean also can be transferred to family list by going to the department who work on this and also had to pay money to do this process In 2010, my father was arrested by Myanmar army in my house while daddy was taking breakfast and at that time I was at KG class. I and daddy were taking breakfast in my balcony at the time about 120 army surrounded my house and shouted their guns to the sky. Then some of them entered into my house, my daddy hands up after seeing this and cried with full of tears on his eyes. And I also cried loudly in front of army. I felt like I was taking the last breath of mine. Those memories bring tears now. While army went to my house to arrest daddy, there were only me, daddy and mommy, and the other brothers were out of home a little bit far away playing. Then they arrested and tied by barbed wire to my daddy and told us that we are gonna shoot him. They took my daddy to a free space and said to my mom, you should pay us 300 lakh. If you cannot pay, we are gonna sentence him in jail for 15 years. My family didn't have any other options except providing them our land properties which cost us about 90 lakh and also gave them 50 tickles gold. They reduced 10 years sentence jail and sentence in the jail for 5 years. After that, my difficult time started. Specifically, I became child labor and cryer for foods. I had a very bad times there. I really wanted to have a tutor in my studies, but this wasn't possible because my family situation was really, really, really bad. I was quite good at studies, and especially I was good at English subject. While daddy was in the jail, I missed him and wanted to ask for new school dress from daddy, but this wasn't really possible for us. There were many days that we cried just for food, there were many days that we had to face too many challenges while daddy, were in, daddy was in the jail. All this happened just because of my government, just because of my country's army. This is not a big reason. Interring in all land is not a big reason. Using mobile phone is not a big crime. My mom is the woman who helped me to stand up to share these stories by pen. She never wanted me to be uneducated. 
She used to tell me, you adult will come and you will enjoy your life like any other child. A school was too much helpful for us, like our school would provide 20 kg rice per three months. I feel cry while I remember those things. Those moments, those moments was really, really bad, especially for our family. Fortunately, daddy didn't need to be for five years in the jail. He was released within four years. He released in 2014. We had started another new life with joy. My father started some business, then bought properties, such as lake and proper land properties, etc. Again, I had a very good life at school, like people, like I got tutor, and everywhere people would love us. And also Dadu, daddy would donate money to poor in every year. We bought cars, expensive Honda, and built a wonderful house. I have many, many, many to tell, but it will take thousand pages to be finished. Just want to say one thing, that is, I only faced all this by my government because they arrested my daddy for simple reason. This is not a crime. Entering in own land, entering in own country is not a big crime. Using mobile phone is not a big crime. They discriminated us. With their discrimination, my childhood memories brings tears on my family's eyes and me. And the third question uh, is, can you share how you and your family face the genocide by the Myanmar government in 2012? Well, now I'm going to share uh, about 2012, 2012, like how my family and me faced genocide in 2012. Myanmar monk killed a group of Tawlik Jamaat and innocent families for no reason with the help of government in 2012. An innocent Rohingya tried to raise voice to get justice, but it wasn't really possible for Rohingya because we Rohingya had to be in discrimination. During those days, Myanmar government kept a rule for Rohingya. It was like Rohingya cannot be able to out from house after 4 p.m. On those moments, my eldest brother had to go outside to look for a missing god. At that moment, the Myanmar army found the Myanmar army found him on the road with a torchlight. And my poor eldest brother was beaten mercilessly by drunk army and also kept him in a place where army lived all the time. This was another biggest attack to fatherless children, to um, fatherless family. Because in, tw in 2012, also daddy was in the jail. I and mommy went to army to talk about my brother. But army demanded for my sister or for our three lakh money. They said to mommy, you should give us your daughter for three nights or you should pay us. Three lakh money. If you cannot do this, we are gonna shoot him. Like they were treating us badly, and you know, we felt very bad. After hearing this, I cried loudly in front of them. But I was gotten a painful slap from commander of army. Then I stopped crying. I was very young. 
I did it now about many things. I cried because I couldn't stop my emotional, because they asked me for my sister. Of course, I don't have a, a sister, and also I don't have money. I didn't have money, my family didn't have money to pay them. As I have mentioned before, we had a very, very, very bad time. <sighs> After that, we could give them neither sister nor money, but they kept my brother for 29 days with them to do many hard works, then released him with a life covered by skin. This is the issue of 2012. Now you can realize how we faced, how we need, how we had to face, and how we felt as a being, a vermis, as a being, a citizen of a, a land. If had to face like this. I had to face all this just because of I'm a Rohingya. And they don't really think us as a human. I'm saying since I'm seeing since my childhood that everywhere discrimination within the country and they don't really care about us. They don't really care about the Rohingya people. Yes. I had to face discrimination at a school and everywhere by monk and government. As the Vien Varmis couldn't see a dream in all land by my government and Nasaka called army. They really discriminated us and I started killing, raping, burning our houses and arresting Rohingya for no reason in 2012. We really couldn't tolerate their torturing and also they still didn't stop doing genocide discrimination on my people, Rohingya. We don't know when it's gonna end. We don't know when it's gonna end. Life is very tough. Life is very difficult for us. We feel like this world is a bad place for us to survive. And the fourth question I have asked him is, please tell us how you have reached to Rohingya refugee camp Kog Bazaar. Now I'm gonna share how I have reached to Rohingya refugee camp Kog Bazaar in Bangladesh. I'm just trying to tell you an incident that I have seen with my own eyes and I have my family saw. This is a very touching that I still, you know, that I still make me cry. That I still um, tell me not to survive in this world. This is the incident I'm gonna share with you now. A group of army came in my area on July 26, 2017, and set us together to all of my neighbors in a place. Then we get out. There were seven virgin among us. At that time, army called those seven virgin by saying us that we have an interview with these virgin girls separately. Then those virgin had to go with thirty army to an empty house by force. This is really shocking. After that, we remaining people were hearing the sound of crying of those virgins. But we remaining people also cried loudly by fear. I still remember those moments. A lot of people were crying in a place where we gathered by Myanmar military. After 22 minutes, those army were returning alone to us and went somewhere by saying us like if you see Bengali tourists call us we will come to arrest them after that we all went to the empty house 
where the army took the, vir the Rohingya Virgin. Then we found two Rohingya Virgin were about to die. Like, they were not talking anything. They were, I felt like they were died, but not. They were in pain. And also, bloods were out in from their vagina. The other five virgins were got pain in their shame places. Because those thirty army raped them mercilessly. This is not only in my village. I can, I can proudly say this because I saw it, this with my own eyes. My family saw this with their own eyes. There are there were many there are many incidents there were many incidents that happened to the Rohingya virgin to the Rohingya women. Rohingya doesn't mean to face rape raping. Rohingya doesn't mean should face genocide. I feel cry now and my heart is crying. You may don't see tears on my eyes, but now my heart is crying because I remember this. I cannot remember all this, you know. When I remember all this, I feel just like I just want to suicide, you know. I just cannot control this. Then finally, on 25 August 2017, I and my family had no option to live there with our life. Then I and my family planned to flee to neighboring country called Bangladesh, now where I am now, in Kausas Bazaar. While outing from host to Bangladesh, didn't really want to come by leaving all of my favorite things, such as motherland, properties, memories, cars, etc. Anyway, I started walking to Bangladesh with tears on eyes and pain in heart. It took five days walking to reach in Bangladesh to get a temporary shelter to survive. Within those five days walking, I saw too many horses, bandon and children, pregnant mothers, all men and women dead by this bandon and fallen on bandon horses yard. Just I could recognize those dead bodies with their leg, backbone, teeth, breast, penis and vagina. While crossing Naf River with the six members of our family, we were crossing the Naf River with an uh, with a fishing boat. We had to cry with the biggest fear and thought that everything is end. In the middle of Naf River, the boat was about to capsize because from the border of Myanmar, some navy were chasing us. But with the grace of God, boat didn't really capsize. And arrived in border of Bangladesh. When I was arriving in Bangladesh, I saw too many of Bengali people were waiting with foods to serve us and pointing with their hand like come quickly, come quickly, and come quickly. Then I stood on land of Bangladesh with the help of Bengali people. This is how I have reached in Bangladesh. And this is why I migrated to the uh, Bangladesh. And you know, I cannot really forget all the help doing by the public of Bangladesh. You know, when I was just coming, I saw to do, I saw too many of Bengali people just serving to my people and you know doing a lots of good things for us i really appreciate it from heart of a genocide survivor me thanks to bangladesh people and bangladeshi uh, for the sixth question is what is your future goal now i'm going to share about my future goal in my future, I have two dreams. One is being a lawyer, another one is being free from refugee camp. 
I want to be free from refugee camp because refugee camp is really hard for me and for my people. And this is, I don't feel that this is a life, you know, this is really difficult. Living under plastic in difficult moment is really hard. And I want to be a lawyer in my future because I want to tell to the world what I faced and what I'm facing. If I can be a lawyer, I can participate in international, you know, international uh, biggest court, international largest court and famous court where I can share about my incident that I, I had to feel genocide by my government and I can raise voice against the government if I, against the government of Myanmar if I can be a lawyer so since before I have decided to be a lawyer if I get up an opportunity to ha have higher education I will be a lawyer because I want to raise this issue in the court of everywhere in the court of like international court and different kinds of court where they uh, they solve this kinds of problem. This is my goal. One is being free from refugee camp. Another one is being a lawyer to raise our issue in different kinds of court. And the last question is, what is your message to our audience for 25th of August, which is known as Rohingya Genocide National Day? My message to the audience and to the people who are listening to my story, who are listening to me, I want you to say, and I want to say to the world to recognize me as a human. I don't think they recognize me as a human. Yes, they are providing ration. They are providing treatment. But it doesn't really make sense. I don't really feel that they are recognizing, they are recognizing us as a human. As I heard in Estolia, a lot of um, animals were killed by, you know, by an expo explosion in the mountain. And also those animals got shelter by the Australian public. Those animals got, uh, you know, treatment, ration. <laughs> I feel like I'm like them. My message to the world to thank me as a human. My message to the people who are listening to me. Do something for us. We don't want to live in the camp anymore. It is intolerable. <coughs> Surviving under plastic is not really easy for everyone. My heart cries in every moment. It cries. It says, I don't want to live in the camp. Do something for me, for my people. Just to help me to go back to my country with peace and dignity you may say we, you may say that international community are providing us a ration <laughs> treatment as like as i said to you before in australia lots of animals were killed in explosion in the mountain they also got treatment they also got different kinds of help from people I feel like I'm, I'm just like them. I feel genocide that people are providing me ration. But ration is not the main thing for us. Work hard for me to send me back from refugee camp to Myanmar with full citizenship, with full peace and dignity. And thank you very much for listening to me. And I hope I will see you again. Thank you. Stay safe in this pandemic. Assalamu alaikum.